for our final song. Um, when we decide, excuse me, when we decide to um, follow Jesus, there is a rest that we enter into with Him. But we thank God for the oasis in time that He has given us in the weekly Sabbath, where we can find physical and spiritual rest and renewal. So we praise Him for the Sabbath rest. And um, stand for our introit, number 167. Hallelujah. Sing to Jesus. We want to thank you that you have set a day aside that we can spend time with thee and that we can be set aside from all the worldly pleasures and have the pleasure to be with thee. And we thank you for this beautiful facility that thou has provided for us that we can come and worship. And we just ask that the Holy Spirit will be here and move each and every one of us as you know the need of each and every one here. In thy name, amen. amen. Now you please remain standing and open your hymnals to our opening song, 576, page 576.
Please be seated. And we'll now have the scripture reading by Molly. John 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him, for the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Let's kneel together as we come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before your throne of grace this morning to recognize not just your love this morning to us, but your authority that you have in our lives. The fact that you created our very bodies in the world that we live in. Lord, we owe to you the honor and glory that's due your name. Father, as we come before you, we open our hearts to you. And Lord, as we confess silently our, our own misgivings to you as so we come before you confessing our sins. Lord, we are grateful for your mercy and your goodness to us. Thank you for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. This morning as we come to you once again, we are grateful for this Sabbath day that you've given to us to worship you. Lord, we're thankful for this time of rest, of true peace in a world that needs more peace. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will touch each one of our hearts through the message today. Lord, we've already heard from our young people in our Sabbath school, and we're so grateful for the way that you have touched them and the way that you have led them and their families and in their classrooms. Father, we give you the praise and the glory this morning. We thank you for the privilege of calling us, each one, to service for you. We thank you for the hope that we have in eternal life. And Lord, we pray these things and we thank you for answering our prayers in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. It is now time for the children's story, so if the children want to get the baskets and pass them around, and we'll have a story.
Well, good morning, guys. How are you today? Happy Sabbath to you. So how many of you have ever been on a plane before? Yeah, where did you go? Egypt. Egypt. Haiti. Haiti. All right. Well, that's, that's a lot of places to go, huh, and a long way. Well, what are those people called inside the main cabin door that hands out beverages and snacks and is there for your safety? What are they called? Anybody know? Well, you got the pilots that's in the front. And who are those people in the cabin? Pilots? And don't say stewardess. They're flight attendants. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you an experience. I used to be a flight attendant for about 12 years. So I'm going to tell you my experience and how I started. And I think that it's safe to say that my family comes in a real fun-sized little package. So one summer, my mom and my dad came up to me and said, hey, do you know that an airline is hiring? And then I looked at my dad and I'm like, um, do you need thicker glasses? Because last time I checked, I'm only five foot one. And so my dad's like, no, they don't have any height requirements. You should just go to the open house. And I said, all right, Dad, I'll humor you. I'll go to the open house. And so I went to the open house, and <laughs> I went to the open house, and I see all these, all these wanting to be flight attendants a lot taller than me. And I'm just looking up, and I think they're looking at me all weird, like, what is she doing here? And I'm like, oh just browsing around, trying to figure things out, and I'm sitting here listening to them handing papers out, and all of a sudden, my dad tells me they don't have a height requirement, and all of a sudden, he, they go, okay, so those people that want to be flight attendants, I need to measure you, and I looked with my big eyes, and I'm just like, oh my goodness, I'm like, they're going to measure? It's like, well, you have to take your heels off. I'm like, oh. I'm like, great. <laughs> so I take my heels off, and she goes, oh, honey, you are just about a half an inch too short. And I just wanted to melt. I wanted to melt right there. I just wanted to be invisible. I just wanted to leave. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just sit back down and just listen to the whole entire thing. Well, you know what? As soon as my mom came to back to pick me up, I just left in the middle of the, they had a um, the little meeting going on. And so I just left. And as soon as my mom picks me up, she goes with her big old smile, she's like, so did you get the job? And I just looked at her and I'm like, why do you have to be so short? And my mom's just like, oh, well, I guess you didn't get the job, did you? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, Mom. And she's like, well, you know what? That's, that's no big deal. God has other plans for you. And I'm like, no, Mom. I'm like, I just wanted to be a couple of inches taller. That would have been so great. And my mom's like, you know what? You have to be happy with what God gives you. And I'm like, all right, well, whatever. And I'm crying all the way back home and crying. And so the next day, my mom's like, you know what? If you really want this job, you can pray about it. And so I prayed about it. And the next day, I get a phone call from the airlines. And they said, you know what? We have a girl that's just like your size. And we would like to try you out and see if you can reach the main cabin door. <laughs> I look at them, and I'm like, when am I ever going to open the main cabin door? So I'm like, all right, I'll go to the airport. And as soon as I get to the airport, all these rampers and all the ground crew are just there, and I think they knew I was coming. And I think they just wanted to see if I can reach the main cabin door. So they have this little tiny jet, and they said, if you can reach up there and open that main cabin door, the job is yours. And I'm, I'm in my tennis shoes, and all I can do is look up at the, look up about, I don't even know how, how many feet up in the air that was, but 
I'm like, how in the world am I going to do this? I'm going to reach up there. And so I'm, I'm like standing there, and she's talking, and all I can think about is saying a little prayer. I'm like, you know, if this is what you really want me to do, God, then you'll help me. So I honestly, as soon as I looked up, and she's like, be ready, I'm like, yep. I jumped so high, and all I think I just touched the tip of my finger and latched onto the handle, and the door just flung open. <laughs> and all I could hear in my voice was, and if I could just scream, I would have, and I did. And it was so loud enough to where a lot of people were just cheering me on, and I'm like, oh, how embarrassing. And you know what? I have been a flight attendant for about 12 years. Well, I'm not a flight attendant anymore, but I actually, you know, I thank God every single day that he gave me the opportunity to become one, and I got to live my dreams. And I pat my mom on the back, and I'm like, hey, shorty, because I'm, lo- <laughs> I'm a little bit taller than her. I'm like, thanks for hanging on and being there for me. And then my sister, she's taller than me, too. She uses me as her little armrest, and she goes, hey there, shorty. How's it going down there? And I'm like, fine. So you know what? Don't be angry or upset. If there's something that you want and you can't get, because God will always be there to provide for your need. And I'm going to share a little bit of a scripture here. And in Philippians 4:19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And before you guys go back to your seats, I do have a little gift for you guys. Compliments to my friends from United. And I just wanted to say thank you for flying with us. (laughs) Bye-bye now. Have a good day. Thank you. Now, at this time, our presentation of gifts will be given to us by Mark, and I just want you to remember that all the loose offering goes to the local church budget, so if you want your offering to go to something else, make sure you mark it on your tithe envelope. Jesus left this planet, he made a promise that he would never leave us alone and forsake us. He would send another helper, comforter. The spirit of the truth would live in us to to guide and convict us of of what is right and wrong and remind us of the consequences of our choices. The Holy Spirit teaches us and helps us to remember things about what we've learned. Now what's a helper that we don't want? Today, the gifts we bring as our worship will support our conference combined youth ministries. Let's continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct our conference leaders and all all its inmates. Together, we will accomplish great things for God's kingdom. Will the deacons please stand? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the provision of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the provision you have made, empowered, and guide your people. Please bless us with a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit as we present these gifts to you. Grant wisdom and boldness to our conference leaders as we partner them today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I would like to take this opportunity to, ch- to um, thank my church family, I'm sure too, for, um, for your prayers on behalf of my daughter, Shira, and your prayers were answered, and uh, the, the outcome was positive. And I want to remind all of you that um, you don't have to go through your struggles in isolation. You have a church family here who is so anxious and willing to pray with and for you so that you don't have to walk through this life alone.
Thank you for that wonderful message. I'm going to remove just a few things here so that I don't break them or trip over them. I wander too much from the pulpit, so I want to make sure I'm okay. I'm going to guess this morning, and tell me if I'm wrong, that probably most in this room, or if not all of us, have experienced love. Young people, children, do you love your parents, your grandparents? Parents, you love your children. Maybe some of you have a very close friend that you love. You know, I think that uh, if you live here in St. Louis, uh, you have to love, and you're, and you're a sports fan, you have to love the Rams or the, or the Cardinals, right? I think that might have been a question of my, my interview. Uh, had to be, had to like those before I could come here. But... We each one have had a, a relationship in some way where love has been our experience. And there are many things in this world that we can love, right? There are many things that are close to us that we enjoy. Those of us sometimes who are those of us who have a, a hobby, we love to do various things. And of course, if you live in Missouri, you have to like to fish. Nobody caught that, did they? Maybe I'm on the wrong side of Missouri. Maybe I have to be further west. All right. But you know what? The love that we experience in this world cannot equal the love that we have for Jesus Christ. Amen? And I want to share with you today about an individual who loved Jesus Christ. His name is Simon Peter. And Peter loved Jesus, didn't he? When Jesus was on this earth and he ministered to people, Peter loved Jesus. He grew to love him very much. Who wouldn't like Jesus? Who wouldn't love Jesus with all the wonderful things that he did while he was here? If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 4. And we'll find out some of the reasons why Peter began to, to really love Jesus, to, to appreciate Jesus. Jesus was preaching in the synagogue this day. And as he left the synagogue, we see in verse 38 of chapter 4 in Luke, that he got up from the synagogue and he entered into Simon's house. And Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked him to help her. And what did Jesus do? Well, he stood there over her, and he rebuked the fever. And it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. And I'm sure that Peter learned to have a a new appreciation for mother-in-laws as Jesus brought healing to her. And she was able to once again go about the house and and help out and to serve. Peter began to to appreciate the power that Jesus had to heal, didn't he? Well, speaking about fishing, I know that Peter liked to fish. Peter was a fisherman, wasn't he? And we read later on here in Luke chapter 5, about Peter's experience once again with Jesus. Now we have to understand this too, that uh, Jesus was not a fisherman, was he, by trade. He was a carpenter, wasn't he? Well, Jesus was preaching to the people there along the shore, and there were so many people that came, Jesus decided, well, I'm going I'm to step into someone's boat. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, in verse 3. And he asked Simon to put out a little bit from the shore, a little bit from the the land there, and he sat down and began to teach the people in the boat. Well, verse 4 tells us, When he was finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and do what? 
do what? Let down your nets? Those of you who fish, (laughs) when's the best time to catch fish? Yeah. Peter said, I've been fishing all night. This is, you know, you're just a carpenter, Jesus. How do you know what time to fish? Certainly now is not the time to fish. I can just imagine what Paul's thinking here. But you know, it didn't last long. He says in verse 5, Well, Master, we've worked all night, the right time to fish, and we haven't caught anything, but if you say let down the nets, we'll let down the nets. I mean, after all, you, you healed my mother-in-law. That's got to count for something. So we'll go ahead and do it. And what happened? They catch so much fish that the nets themselves begin to break. They can't even haul in the, the catch, can they? They have to go and they have to call uh, James and John to come over, their business partners, and they came over to the boat, and they had to help them haul in the nets. So much that the boats began to sink. Now, if you fish, wouldn't that be a miracle? And Peter comes to Jesus, and he says something very interesting here. In verse 8, he says, Go away! Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. I can just picture Peter there saying, Go away, as he's holding on to Jesus' legs. Peter didn't feel worthy of this wonderful miracle. But I think that Peter's love for Jesus grew even more, don't you? As he witnessed this wonderful thing. And Jesus says to him, don't fear. Don't worry, Peter. Now you're going to be fishing for men. And as they got back to the shore, the story goes that they left everything that they had. Now, if I were a fisherman and I were in business... And I just caught a huge load of fish, and I, to the point where my boat was sinking, what would you do? I'd sell it. I'd go right to the market, because, you know, fresh fish is better than moldy fish. So I'd go right to the market, and I'd try to sell that. But that's not what Scripture tells us, is it? Peter loved Jesus so much for what he's shown him that he said, I'm willing to give up all of this cash and follow you. That's love, folks, isn't it? Well, Jesus showed his love for the people so many different ways, and Peter learned to grow and to love Jesus. Jesus healed other people. Jesus fed thousands of people, didn't he? And Peter stands back and he watches all this happen in awe of this wonderful person. Yeah, Peter loved Jesus. Jesus even commended Peter one time because Peter recognized his true identity, didn't he? You remember that? Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter raises his hand and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you're right. And the Holy Spirit led you to say that, Peter. Peter loved Jesus. You know, there was a time, too, when they were out in the boat once again, and this figure was approaching them from out of the dark. And they said, look, a ghost, right? The disciples, as they saw this, whatever it was, coming to them. And Jesus calls out to them and says, no, wait, it's me. And what does Peter do? Because of his love for Jesus, he says, If you are Jesus, let me do what? Let me step out of this boat and come to you. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had a friend that you loved dearly, and they were walking across the water and coming to you in a boat, would you say to that person, if you really are my friend, would you let me come out onto the water and walk to you? How many would do that? Oh my. Peter must have really loved Jesus. 
to be able to step out of that boat, to have the confidence to step out of that boat and walk to Jesus. And he did, didn't he? Well, for a little while anyway. Peter walked on water because he loved Jesus. Jesus even prayed for Peter, didn't he? Let's take a look at that. Luke chapter 22. Jesus prayed for Peter. Verse 31. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Jesus says, I prayed for you. How many of you, when you have a friend, when you have someone that you love, pray for you? Doesn't that really endear you to them? You know, when someone comes to me and says, you know what, Ken, I'm, I'm praying for you in this particular difficulty or that difficulty. I'm praying for you to have more faith. I'm praying for you to have strength. You know what, that just, that really feels good, doesn't it? To know someone is praying for you. Jesus prayed for Peter, and Peter loved Jesus for it. Jesus said something else to Peter that night. He continues on with this very verse here. We read 31, part of 32. Jesus says, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, because he loved him so much, he said, I'm willing to do anything for you, Jesus. What else can I do? You prayed for me. You healed my mother-in-law. You, you, you caught so much fish that we couldn't fit it in the boats. You fed all these people. And I don't quite understand what you're saying when you're praying for me, Lord. But you know what? I'm ready to go to prison and to death for you. My friends, if one of your closest people that you love asked you to go to prison or perhaps die, would you do that? Or would you think about it a little bit? Peter said to Jesus, because I love you, I am willing to die for you, Lord. I'm willing to go to prison for you if it takes, whatever it takes. Yeah, Peter loved Jesus, didn't he? I mean, that's love, isn't it? If your pastor asked you to go to prison for him, would you do it? Do you love me that much? You know, I like when people love their pastors. Would you die for your pastor? That's what Peter said. Do you believe Peter? (laughs) Jesus needed to say this to Peter. Because I think Peter needed to hear this. In verse 34, Jesus said, Peter, Peter, (laughs) I assure you that the rooster will crow today, will not crow today until you have denied me three times. Peter would have none of that. No, 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 it's not going to happen that way, Lord. I love you too much to deny you. I love you too much to turn away from you. And perhaps there are those of us here today who said, no, it's never going to happen to me. I'm never going to turn away from the Lord because I love Him. Do you love the Lord? Are we like Peter? No, it's not going to happen that way, Lord. I am going to go to jail for you. I'm going to commit my life to you no matter what it takes. Amen? Is that what we're willing to do? That's what Peter was willing to do. And I know that he loved the Lord. 
We've established that. Imagine just Peter's surprise. Even after saying to Jesus in Matthew, as he records it, even if everybody else, even if all these other disciples go away from you, I will remain true to you. And if we could take this room today and say, you know what, this part of the room may deny, this part of the room may deny, most of these people in the middle may deny, but you know what, there may be one person who says, you know what, I will not deny, even if everybody else in this room leaves. I will not deny the Lord. Sounds pretty bold. But Peter didn't know what was going to happen next. As Jesus was arrested that night, Peter, because he loved Jesus so much, wanted to get as close as he possibly could. You know, he, he wasn't like some of the other disciples that you know, left, right? They left, didn't they? They scattered. Jesus said it was going to happen. But John and Peter followed along. Peter got as close as he could get. And when the time of testing came, Peter did just what Jesus told him would happen. Have you ever had a relationship with someone that you love? And in that moment of testing, in that moment when things seemed so critical, when your back was up against the wall, did you fail that love for that person? The test of love? No doubt the husbands in this room would say, I'd give my life for my wife, wouldn't you? I would stand in the way of a speeding bolt. I would stand in the way of of anything that would come between life and my wife. I love my wife. And I'd like to think that I would do anything that I possibly could to keep her safe and my children. That's what we do. That's what we say we do. But you know what? When the time of testing comes, do we really know how we will respond? Peter was so confident in his love for Jesus that he deceived his own self. He says, I will not abandon you, and yet, as Peter's warming his hands there, and he's accused of certain things, of knowing this man, Jesus, who's been led away, who doesn't stand a chance in the courts, Weren't you with him? Aren't you the person who really loves Jesus, willing to do whatever he asked you to do? Imagine if you were a fly on the wall in that room and said, Peter, aren't you the one that said that you would go to prison if you had to? This same Peter denied Jesus three times, and as he looks into Jesus' eyes, as the gospel tells us, He sees the eyes of Jesus as he's passing by, bound for what Jesus said would be his death. Can you imagine what Peter felt like? This man that he loved. The rooster crows and Jesus looks his way and their eyes meet. And Peter can't take it. He runs away, just like all the rest of the disciples who scattered. He thought he was doing good by getting there close to Jesus. He thought he could be there and maybe do something. But he ends up running away. After he denies that he even knew this man, the man that he loved, he denied he even knew him. My friends, do we love Jesus like Peter loved Jesus? Do we love him in times, good times, and times when things are going well, when we think that, you know what, hey, look at what the Lord's doing in my life. He's doing this miracle and that miracle. Every time I turn around, he's doing something fantastic. This guy's great. 
But then when the time of testing comes in your life, do you still love the Lord enough to forsake everything else? Peter thought he would. And then we come to our text this morning. <clears throat> After everything was done, the good news is that Jesus was released from the prison of death, wasn't he? By his own free will, he was raised from life to give us hope. Amen? And so we fast forward through this. And Jesus meets him for the third time as, guess what? Peter's out there fishing. And I can imagine that Peter is sitting there. We can read about it here. The disciples were there in, in chapter 21 of, of John. And I can just imagine that Peter, although he witnessed Jesus' resurrection, he saw him in person, that there was something that just was eating at Peter. Can you imagine that? You just denied the person you said you loved. Things worked out fine, but now what? You're always wondering, what is he going to say to me now? What is Jesus going to say to me? So in verse 3, Peter goes back to something he's, he's known for a long time, something he's comfortable with, and he says, I'm going fishing. You ever feel like that sometimes? I just want to go fishing. I just want to get away from my desk. I just want to get away from life. And I want to go somewhere, some familiar place, and do something that I feel like I can accomplish because you know what? It just doesn't seem like I've accomplished much in my life. So Peter goes out and goes fishing, and the rest of them go fishing with him. Sometimes that can be therapeutic, can it? To get things off your mind doing something else. And Jesus meets them there at the shore and he calls them in. And actually, what's interesting here is he called them before to follow him. What does he say this time? He says, cast the net, right? It's interesting. He says, cast the net on the boat, on the right side of the boat. And they catch fish. And John says, you know what? It's Jesus. Peter didn't wait too long. He got on his garments and he took on out after him reminiscent of that first time that Jesus called his disciples. As they were sitting there at the, the campfire there and they were cooking the, the fish, Jesus talks to Peter. And what does Jesus say? In verse 15, let's read it again. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Remember when you said that you loved them more than loved me more than any of these others. He says, Simon, do you love me more than these? What was Peter's response? Yes. You know I love you, Lord. But Jesus continues. A second time he asked Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time he leaves out the others. And what does Peter reply? Yes, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. And Jesus asks him a third time, Simon, do you love me? Now Peter was a little turned off. He was a little disappointed, perhaps, that Jesus would ask him a third time. We'll find out here just in a moment, perhaps, how this played out. Because, you know, in the English language, there's something lost in the translation here in this particular passage. But Jesus asks him a third time, and Peter just, I'm sure, sighed. said, Lord, you know everything. <laughs> you know that I love you. All three times that Jesus asked Peter if you love me, he gave him a commission each time, didn't he? What was that commission? To feed my sheep. Wherever their experience is, wherever their spiritual life is, I want you to take care of my sheep. 
Wasn't Jesus the shepherd? Isn't that what he said when he was here on this earth? I am the good shepherd. And he says to Peter, I want you to do as I have done. I want you to shepherd my sheep for me. He could just as well have been talking to each one of us here in this room. He says, I want you to shepherd my sheep. But I want to dwell on something else in this text. I want to dwell on this idea of love. And what Jesus was saying and what Peter was saying, because both of them used the same word, didn't they? And for those of you who are scholars and those of you who have studied this passage, you will know that there's a little bit of difference in what God is, what Jesus is calling love and what Peter calls love. There are two different Greek words that are used in this passage for love. And I'm sure that uh, many of you are familiar with uh, at least one of them. Jesus, when he asked Peter the first time, he said, Peter, do you love me? He used the word agapeo. You've heard of the word agape, right? When Peter responded to Jesus, he responded with a different word, phileo. Jesus says, do you agape on me? Peter says, I phileo you. Well, what's the difference? Marvin Vincent in his book called Word Studies in the New Testament talks about these two words. He says, phileo emphasizes the affectional element of love and agapeo, the intelligent element of love. You see the difference? There's an affectionate level of love, an emotional sort of love, a brotherly sort of love, associated with the word phileo. And then there's this intelligent element. There's this principle-minded, there's this, you dare say, logical side of love that's described in agape love. And Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me in a way that's intelligent? Do you love me in a way that's principled? And Peter responds to Jesus by saying, well, I love you as a friend. Do you see the difference? Jesus is looking for something a little bit more than what Peter has to offer. The last time Jesus asked Peter, he actually picks up on what Peter was saying to him. And so the last time that Jesus says in verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He's saying, Simon, do you love me? Phileo me. Am I really what you say? Do you really love me like you say you love me? In other words, do you really love me as a friend? Does Jesus want to be our friend, folks? Do we really love him in that way? You know, when other texts describe God and his the relationship that he had with his son Jesus Christ, he uses both words for love. Indeed, Jesus wants to be our friend. He says to Peter, do you really love me the way that you say that you love me? Perhaps Peter was a little offended by that. Folks, do you love Jesus the way you say that you love Jesus? Or are you offended that the pastor would even ask that question? Friends, I think that we need to be offended occasionally. In order to test our love for Jesus, the one who we say that we love. You see, Jesus in his mercy was not just trying to embarrass Peter here, was he? Do you think that Jesus was simply trying to embarrass him? Thus, the other part of the conversation, he wanted him to shepherd the sheep. But I want you, Peter, I want you to do this mission that I'm giving you. I want you to do it for the right reasons. I want you to do it because you truly love me. In the book Desire of Ages, Ellen White writes this. She says, The question that Christ had to put to Peter was significant. He mentioned only one condition of discipleship and service. Lovest thou me? 
he said. This is the essential qualification. Do I hear an amen to that? Jesus says, do you love me? This is essential, she says. She continues, though Peter might possess every other ability, if you will, yet without the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the Lord's flock. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, gratitude, and zeal are all aids in the good work, but without the love of Jesus in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. That's powerful. You can do everything. You remember 1 Corinthians 13, what Paul talks about there. Don't you? He gives this list of things that you can do for the Lord. But if you don't have love, it's a failure. Do you agree? Folks, that's some powerful stuff. On page 816 of the same book, she says... Heretofore, Peter had known Christ after the flesh, as many know him now. But he was no more to be thus limited. He knew him no more as he had known him in his association with him in humanity. She said, before Peter knew him in the flesh, Peter knew him as a friend. Peter knew him in a limited sort of way. He had loved him, she says, as a man, As a heaven-sent teacher, he now loved him as God. He had been learning the lesson that, uh, that to him Christ was all in all. Now he was prepared to share in his Lord's mission of sacrifice. When we have the right love for Jesus Christ, we are ready for the mission that he's given to us. Friends, Jesus is asking us today, just as he asked Peter back then, do you love me? You know, you say that you love me, but do you really love me? Friends, do you love Jesus Christ enough not to be limited by just this friendship but by the very love and the very reason that God sent His Son on this earth to die for our sins. That, my friends, is agape love. Jesus even said in Matthew 10, 37, that if you love, phileo love, your mother or father, your son or your daughter, if you love your family more than me, what did He say? You're not worthy of me. If you have a greater emotional attachment to the people on this earth, if you have a greater attachment on this earth, the emotional attachment to whatever it is that you do, you're not worthy of Jesus Christ. I didn't say this. He said it. My friends, we are limited when we don't love Jesus above everything else, even our own flesh and blood. It's that important. My friends, Jesus is inviting us today to have the kind of love that it's going to take to do his ministry effectively. Otherwise, we fail. We don't want to be failures, do we? Because ultimately, it leads to death. Jesus says of each one of us, Ken, do you love me? Do you love me the way you say that you love me? Do you love me more than anyone in this room? Or do you just profess that love for me? He says, Ken, you've got to figure it out. You have to figure that out. He said to Peter, now when you convert, what the King James uses, there in Luke, 
He said, Peter, it's, this is when Jesus was praying for Peter, remember? He said, Satan wants to take hold of you and he wants to do his will with you. And I prayed for you, Peter, remember? And he says, when you turn around or when you convert, what did he say? I want you to strengthen your brethren, right? Right? I want you to strengthen those around you. I want you to do, to do the mission that I've asked you to do. When you convert, I want you to do the mission that I've asked you to do. Friends, he says that to us today. Perhaps we, like Peter, have denied Jesus in our lives. Perhaps we, like Peter, have fallen down, not once, not twice, maybe three times, maybe more. And we go off and we cry. Particularly when we realize that Jesus knows what he's talking about. (laughs) And Jesus says, when you've had a good cry, then get up on your feet. When you've converted, when you've realized that what you really need to do, then I want you to come follow me. And so, my friends, that invitation stands for everyone in this room who feels like they've been a failure. Do you feel like you're a failure sometimes? I know I do. I know sometimes I say the wrong things. I know sometimes I come and I I just make a mess of things. And Jesus says, Ken, that's okay. Go have a cry, and then I want you to come back, and I want you to do my will. That's what he's saying to you today. Don't wallow in your failures. That's what Satan wants you to do. Satan wants you to be the Judas who says, I've had enough and I'm going to go end my life and that's all there is to it. Jesus says, there's so much more to your life than what you think. I know I'm going over time here. I'm sorry. I hope none of you are getting too hungry. I am. My stomach's rumbling. I'm glad this microphone's not down there. It's good news, friends. We can learn to love Jesus as we learn as Christians in our Christian walk. We can grow and we can grow and we can grow. It's not some static thing. It's not something like you say, well, I love Jesus now and it's ever going to be the same. No, there are times when we fail. There are times when we have to be converted once again. Peter had to learn after three and a half years with this man that he learned to love, that he needed to be converted. And Peter learned, didn't he? Not much longer after that, Peter spoke a sermon that stirred a thousand souls, three thousand souls into conversion. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what you can do when you learn to love Jesus the way he wants you to love him? This room would be filled to overflowing Friends, let's pray for that kind of love, shall we? The kind of love that will draw on the Holy Spirit and it will speak to us all in ways that we know uniquely so. Each one of you has a gift. Each one of you has a unique gift. And God has placed that responsibility on each one of us to serve Him because we truly love Him. Do you love Him? Grow in his love. Do you love him? Shepherd the sheep. Do you love him like you say you love him? God is calling each one of you to ministry. Do you believe that? I hope you do. I want to hear more amens. God is calling each one of you to ministry. To be a minister to someone. Maybe to thousands of people. And God can do it through each one of us. He just needs us to be willing to love him. That is the basis, my friend, of everything that we do in this church, everything that we do in our lives. It must be love. If we do not love one another, the Holy Spirit is not going to be here. And we will fail. My friends, is there someone that you need to go to today? Is there someone you need to go to and make things right? Maybe you need to go on your knees and go to God and say, you know what, I just need to make things right, Lord. You know, I've said I've loved you for all these years and 
and yet I really don't feel like I've been converted. Maybe that's what we need to do. We can pray as a church for the conversion of everyone, not just in here, but in our community. And we have great opportunities, as Alex is speaking to us throughout the week, to come, to invite, to share the truth with other people. Not because we have to, not because we're obligated to, but because we love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we're grateful to Him for His mercy on us. My friends, that's why I hope that you're volunteering to come each night. Not because you have to. There's some great truths that Alex is presenting to our community. I'd like to invite those of you who have not come to come out and to experience that because the Holy Spirit is working here. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege that you've given to each one of us to work with you in the shepherding of souls for your kingdom. We thank you for the example that we have in Peter that even though he struggled, even though, Lord, he learned to love you one way before and he was converted and loved you even more afterward, Lord, we know that we can have that same experience in life and we know that you will accept our love because you know our hearts. Lord, we must love you more than anything else, more than anyone else, in order for us to be as effective as we can be, as we should be, in order for us to be worthy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he gave up so much for us. Lord, there is nothing to compare in this world, as Paul says, to the riches and the glory that we will have in heaven. Lord, this is the hope that we have. And I pray for each person here today that they will recognize your gift to them for the salvation of others. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I I want to invite Jason, where are you? you, Oh, there you are. (laughs) We want to take just a few minutes. Are we on for this? are we good? Okay. Why don't you come on up, at Jason, and I want you to introduce someone. Uh, this, has been, this was in your bulletins, and uh, if you take that microphone there. Um, this is a, a wonderful experience that we have that we can be a part of as a church. Um, something happened with the new church in Acts. Uh, the Lord was doing great and wonderful things for the church, um, but something came up and some people were being overlooked. The widows were being overlooked. And uh, so the disciples thought they would get together and they would um, select some folks, to some men, to take care of the various needs uh, in their community. And so they did that. And today we want to, uh, uh, we do that as a practice in the Adventist church. And today we want to continue that practice uh, by inviting one of our, our, our members here who has Uh, received the call and has accepted the call to ministry in the way of a deacon. And I've asked our head deacon, uh, Jason Matthews, to come up and introduce him and have him come come on up forward. And uh, we want to recognize his leadership in the area of of, uh, deacon uh, for this church. And uh, we just want you to to be a part of this. Okay, so I'd like to introduce him, Jason. Y.L. Galini, would you please uh, come up? Join us. Um, as the pastor mentioned, Amen. Uh, Yael has uh, always been very helpful. Um, he has stepped forward not only uh, during Sabbath and during the services, but. Um, in assisting outside of the services, um, just offering his time and availability uh, shows that the Lord is working through him. It's, it's not a burden 
for any one of our deacons and actually any one of us to work for for the church and the church family. And uh, Yael exemplifies that. Yael? Is that right? Okay. I'll make sure I get that right. Um, the one thing that, uh, that qualifies a deacon is they uh, brought them forward as the disciples uh, selected them. And, and I believe that you are that person here. Um, when they selected men, they, it was important to them that they select men who were of good reputation, men who were full of the Spirit. Can you imagine that? Men who uh, had wisdom. And uh, these were the, some of the attributes of these men that they selected. And I'm certain that God has, uh, uh, has ordained you already for this service. And we are simply here to recognize God's call on your ministry. And so today I want to, uh, to gather around you. And I would like for all of the ordained uh, elders to come forward. If you're not serving, that's fine. But all of the ordained elders, please come forward at this time. And I would like to surround while with our... Uh, with our prayers. And uh, Jason, you as well as the head deacon, I would like for all of us to, uh, to gather around. And, and if you would, please, can you kneel down here and then see if we can have some room we can get around you. And just if you can get around so you can place your hand on them. Um, as Adventists, we, we, what we call this is an ordination service where we ordain uh, our deacon and, and uh, our leaders to service. We are simply accepting God's call on their life because God has already ordained them for service. And so we recognize as a church as he's given us authority to do so. And um, so what I would like to do is uh, uh, do that now, and I'm going to ask our head elder if he would pray over uh, while and commission him for service. Please bow your heads with us as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful for your faithfulness to us and your willingness to use us in our imperfect state. Lord, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to inspire us to want to do more for you. Lord, I thank you for each person that's represented up here today and for their desire to want to serve you. And today especially as we recognize Yael and his um, Stepping forward saying, Lord, here am I. Use me. I, I want to fill the role of deacon. I, I realize what's involved with that role. And I commit my heart and my service to you. Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to pour over him, to fill him. And that he can desire more and more to want to do what you would have him to do in your name. And that all of these things would originate in you, from you. And for you, because only you are worthy of glory and praise. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we close our service with our song, uh, please turn with me. I don't know if I'm taking someone else's job here. Five, number 531 in your hymnals. I want you to pay close attention to the words in this hymn as we move forward as a church, as we move forward uh, in Christ. The last stanza I just want to, to draw your attention to, and I'll read it for you. This is hymn number 573. I'll go where you want me to go. It says, There's surely somewhere a lowly place in earth's harvest field so wide where I may labor through life short day by, for Jesus and the crucified. So trusting my all unto thy care, I know thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with a heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I hope that's, that's our prayer, to be who he wants us to be. Would you stand and sing with us?
Father in heaven, we want to be who you want us to be. We want to go where you want us to go. Father, help us to do that through your strength, through your spirit, through your wisdom. Be with each one of us, Lord. May we love you the way that you want us to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.